I was reading last night that it's always good to start a presentation with a joke because it lets you gauge the humor of the audience and it kind of lets you know how well the talk's going to go. So I'm a psychologist, so here's a psychology joke. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Only one, but the bulb really has to want to change. <laughs> We might be okay, let's see. So, today I want to talk about the role of culture in traffic safety, and, and uh, Linda spoke about differences in, in country traffic safety performance, US, Canada, Sweden. And part of that reason is how the culture affects road users' choice about how to behave on the roads, and stakeholder, I have to climb up on the podium apparently, um, and stakeholder decisions about what actions to take to promote safety in their countries. So I want to talk a bit about um, the role of culture and traffic safety and how we approach it uh, in, our, in our center. Um, ultimately, we're here to talk about Washington State's target zero and how to help get Washington to its target of zero by 2030. And when we do that, we need to consider what are some of the factors that are contributing to crashes, not only in Washington State, but nationally. And we can categorize those in terms of three areas, some aspect of the road contributing to the crash, ice, for example, some aspect of the vehicle, poor brakes, or what the road user does or doesn't do in terms of behavior while they're driving. And as Linda mentioned, 95% uh, of crashes here and in other countries, in whole or in part, can be attributed to some behavior or a lack of the right behavior by the road user. And in fact, 65% of crashes, it's just the fault of the driver. So it really comes down to focusing on the road user if we need to get down to zero. And ultimately, that becomes a, a, a question of understanding why road users do what they do. What are the reasons for human behavior when they're operating vehicles or otherwise using the roadway system? Before we answer the question as to how or why humans behave as they do, Let's take this as a simpler example. Tom, could you hit the video? So you'll see the plant moving toward the window. Okay, you can pause it, Tom. The question is, why did that plant change its behavior and move toward the window? Anybody? Sunlight. If I wanted to change, where, is, this, is the ship sinking? Where are we going? We'd like to see your presentation. All right. <laughs> Panic there for a second. Um, so if we, if we were, <laughs> instead of traffic safety people, we were plant people, how would we change that plant's behavior and make it turn to the right? Craig, open the other window. Easy peasy. Trouble is, humans aren't that simple in terms of the behaviors they choose. In this case, why is this person about to behave the way he is? You can pause. If you know the answer, don't say it. But any ideas why a person might go to the beach and do that in public? What was that? Lots of alcohol. Lots of alcohol. <laughs> very, very possible. Skip ahead about 20 seconds. You can all join in if you're feeling the mood. It turns out it's a, a flash mob dance. So it's done as part of a social activity. It's a group of people who share membership, identity with a group of people who do these mob dances. And it's what you do is socially appropriate within this group in this context. Which is a slightly um, entertaining way, hopefully, to point out that we are social beings. 
It's a, a innate in human nature to be social, to belong to groups, to function in groups, to identify with groups. And so the culture of our, the groups that we identify with are critical to us as human beings. Sharing a common culture lets us function together as a group in a coordinated, collaborative way to deal with hazards in the environment. Belonging to a group, sharing a culture, is an important part of our own identities and how we see ourselves and how we define ourselves and how we get confidence in dealing with the world. Consequently, we often make decisions that we think will increase our acceptance by the groups that are important to us and avoid those behaviors that, you th that we think will lead to rejection. And we can probably all think of some painful childhood moments when we weren't accepted and we were rejected and we're still working on those issues. Um, but essentially we need to think about road users as social beings who belong to different kinds of groups and those groups have cultures that influence their decisions to be dangerous or safe on the roads. We need to look at the social context of driving. And to help us understand in a more applied way what culture of traffic safety is, we have a definition that we use. Traffic safety culture is defined as the values and beliefs. Values being the things that, are, that we prioritize, that are important to us, our ideal situations to which we aspire, and beliefs are our beliefs about how the world works. So we define culture as what's inside our head which motivates our decisions to make dangerous or safe choices, healthy or unsafe choices. Shared values and beliefs, and it's shared because it's what's common to the group. It's part of the group's identity. The values and beliefs for one group may be different than the values and beliefs for another group. So this group may not understand those people's behaviors because they don't share the values and beliefs that are driving those people's decisions. To understand people's decisions, we need to get in and understand what their values and beliefs are. And here we're talking about deliberate behaviors, ones that are intentional or willful, not accidental or habitual. Um, it's shared amongst road users, the people who are not wearing their seatbelt, the people who are drinking and driving, the people who are speeding, the people who are picking up their cell phone. But it's also the culture of the agencies that are responsible for traffic safety. What's their internal culture and how does the values and beliefs they have determine how much they prioritize resources for traffic safety and the kinds of things they try and do about traffic safety. This is what traffic safety culture sounds like. This is a focus group of people who habitually, well, almost politically, don't wear their seat belts. I feel that I should be told what I have to do or not, uh -huh. especially in a vehicle. Yeah, it's kind of your own. Your own, should be your own decision. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that goes like smoking in your vehicle and whatever you want to do, turn up your radio loud, which I will never do. I don't because if I was to get in a wreck, there is a chance that I could live by being thrown from the car than if I was stuck behind a seatbelt. Yes. Who is that woman? <laughs> uh, so there you heard the first gentleman's talking from his values, that his Autonomy to choose what he wants to do is more important than other things like his safety. It's his right to choose what he does in his own vehicle. That's a value statement as part of his culture. The woman's talking about her belief system. She believes if she's in a crash, she'll be thrown from the car and land on her feet and keep on walking and it'll be fine. That makes no sense to us. Wearing a seat, not wearing a seatbelt makes, makes no sense to us. But for these groups of people who have that culture, that behavior makes sense within the context of their culture, because that's the culture that's driving the decision to do it. So if we need to change people's behavior like this, we need to take a step back, dig in, and find out what the culture is that's driving that decision. Only by understanding that culture can we produce strategies that are effective in that particular culture. This is what culture looks like. This is an artifact of culture. You can buy this on many online automotive part stores. Uh, this one is for a West Coast Corvette. You can get a device that you stick in your seatbelt so the thing doesn't bing at you anymore, and you can open your uh, tall boy. So it's a double win there. Uh, 25 bucks worth. So 25 bucks. This is being sold because there's a market for it. If there's a market for it, there's a culture 
around seat belts if they don't want to wear it. And they're okay with the idea of maybe having easy access to a beer while driving. So things like this in our environment tell us about what the culture is. They're manifestations of what our culture is. They're artifacts. And we care about traffic safety culture because it's hard to make changes in the behaviors we want when the social environment is pushing back against us. And that's when we, why we look at some statistics. This is crash risk. This is, this is fatal fatalities per, uh, per capita. Is it? Nope. It's uh, fatalities per vehicle mile traveled. The blue line is Washington State. The red line is the US. And you see that risk early on dropped dramatically. We got safer much quicker year by year because we're doing big leaps and bounds, safer roads, safer vehicles, airbags, et cetera, et cetera. But now if you look at the far right side, which is just a couple of years ago, we're flattening out. And the argument, one of the arguments is we're flattening out because we're excuse me, pushing against our existing traffic safety culture that thinks it's okay to speed, that doesn't want more speeding enforcement, that won't accept red light running cameras and automatic speed enforcement. So if you want to push through that floor and get to zero, we need to change the culture that's stopping us right now. <clears throat> and one of the best examples of how our culture is pushing back against us is with speeding. One of the things we know for sure that speeding is a significant crash factor, as we heard moments ago. It increases the energy that dissipated in the crash, leading to more in severe injuries, it's, and it, it, it lengthens your stopping distance so you're more likely to have the crash in the first place. We know that speed is deadly because we have commercials like this. The most advanced ammunition in the world, Superformance from Hornady. Up to 200 feet per second faster than any conventional oh, ammunition. So we know that speeding is dangerous when they make commercials about bullets showing how fast they are and use the metaphor of a vehicle. Unfortunately, as another artifact of our culture, we have, you see many of these car commercials that advertise speed and how fast you can go in the car as being a sales feature, a desirable feature. It's like having extra nicotine cigars. So ironically, we have this flip side of the commercial you just saw about the bullet. Go ahead. So the reverse metaphor. This was a Super Bowl commercial, prime time. So how can we hope to reduce speeding and be more welcomed in enforcing speeding laws when the culture values speeding? We need to shift that culture somehow, otherwise we're not going to be successful in our efforts. And some of you might say, well, we're already doing this. We're already changing behavior. We're already changing attitudes. And that's true, and we should keep doing, doing that as well. But I want to suggest that the traffic safety culture paradigm sort of brings more tools, a fresh perspective on how we do that. And arguably, there are a few things that the traffic safety culture paradigm does that's a bit different. It slightly refocuses our efforts. And the fir first is, there's lots of ways to change people's behavior. Um, I could make people slow down on my street by standing there with my shotgun. But does it change their opinion about speeding? Probably not. Um, are they going to speed up once they go around the corner? Probably. So what we're trying to do with traffic safety culture is to create a change that's sustainable. 
that people uh, don't speed because it's no longer who they are. It's not what our family does. It's not what people in Kennewick do. It's not what people in my, uh, on my street do. It's not who we are anymore. Because I may not speed on a piece of road when I know there's an officer there with a radar gun, but that's only one place at one time. My social identity with my family or my, my neighbors is always with me. So if I make the choice not to speed because we don't do that, I won't do that whether there's a cop there or not. So we're trying to move to that way of changing how people define speed in relation to their own culture so that it's sustained. They don't speed all the time and everywhere. One way of looking at it is that we're actually trying to transform culture and transform the relationship between road users and the agencies that support them. So using the Washington Traffic Safety Commission as an example, we can so sort of the traditional model that Washington wants to reduce speeding, so they decide to install speed bumps and the road users slow down on that piece of roadway. But in other places, they might still speed. So what we're trying to do instead is to look at how can we look at the culture of the agencies to increase the priority of safety, to increase their openness to innovation in the types of things they do to improve traffic safety, and one of those things is to recognize that road users are social beings that have a culture, and to understand that culture and try and shift that culture so the safe behavior becomes the normal thing to do. So if they take strategies that help shift the culture of road users, you now have road users that have a higher value for traffic safety, believe they have a role in not only being safe for themselves, but for people who are important to them. And they will actually turn back to the agencies and say, hey, do more of what you do to make us safer. And then you get this transformation where the relationship is now a cycle. The agency does things, road users are safer, they value safety more, they turn back to the agency and say, do more for us now. I don't know whether you feel that's working right now for you, how many road users call up and say, hey, do more enforcement. But the goal is to shift culture where it becomes a partnership. The cultures work together, and it's self-reinforcing and sustainable. That's the ultimate goal for what we're trying to do with uh, the cultural approach. The other thing that's a little different about the cultural approach, or at least the way that we approach it, is that traditionally we've changed behavior and changed attitudes by using fear tactics. We've scared people into being safe. We show them the worst possible scenario in the most gruesome possible way, like this. <clears throat> this is a guerrilla campaign that was done by a community around a school zone where they created posters of a child as if they would hit the windscreen in a proportional way that when you get in your, after you, you be parked your car and go away, they put these posters all along the, the street or outside the school get back inside your car and it looks like there's a child dead lying on top of your car. <clears throat> That's kind of the traditional model for forcing change through fear. <clears throat> and there's a number of reasons why we don't advocate that, but um, one is it doesn't show you the, what the correct behavior is, it just shows you the terrible aftermath. It doesn't show you what you're desiring people to do. What we tend to focus on is changing culture through this idea of hope, and hope is a combination of concern this is a serious issue with a willingness and a path forward, but this is how you can solve it. Concern alone doesn't get you as far as you need to be. You need concern with a path forward, and together you get hope. And I think this is a really good example of a commercial that has hope in it. Uh, it starts off with a lot of concern, and I'll let you decide for yourself how hopeful it feels. an enemy among us. It takes away the lives of our loved ones. It shatters our families. It consumes our dreams and destroys our future. It has taken more of our people than war, disease, or crime. The 
time has come to be strong. The time has come to fight back. Save a life, save a nation. Do we feel the hope there? <clears throat> Much different looking kind of ad. There's no gruesome outcome in it. But there's a lot of concern about the role of alcohol and driving drunk in that community. The other part of the con that goes with the concern is it shows that within that community, there is a solution. The community coming together, engaging what we called yesterday citizenship behavior or bystander intervention, helping the person at risk do the safe thing and do the right thing. It also shows something interesting about the cultural approach, and that is that often the solution to the community's problem is in the community already. You just need to guide them to it. In this case, the tribe has a strong sense of community, a strong uh, respect for the elderly, a strong value for protecting the community, and that's the solution to promoting this bystander intervention approach. You just need to show them that's the positive solution that they already have in their community and help them grow it and leverage it. So that's another difference about the cultural approach is we don't bring in the solutions and go, here's the better culture, or here's a speed bump. The solution already exists in the community. We simply help them nurture it. And by growing it inside their community, they have more ownership, more acceptance of it, uh, and it tends to function better. The other thing that the cultural approach does is that we um, bring a model that lets you measure culture and predict how it may impact willingness and intention to be dangerous or safe. And by having this model, it lets you be a little more uh, focused and rational in what kinds of questions you ask to measure people's, to access people's values and beliefs. And by analyzing uh, components of the model from interviews or surveys or whatever, you can see which parts of culture are most important for that group for that behavior, and that's the box you try and grow through your cultural strategies. So I think I'm going to give you an example. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to tell you what I mean about the box. The boxes. The boxes contains a bunch of things slightly expanding from this notion of values and beliefs. So that model has values, what we think is important, what we value as being uh, priorities. Beliefs, again, how we think the world works. Attitudes, are we positive or negative toward an object or a behavior? Like or dislike? Norms, what we think most people like us do, or what most people like us expect us to do. Image, what we think the typical person is like who does the behavior. Is it a positive image or a negative image? And perceived control. To what extent do we think we have the ability to engage or not engage in the behavior? And all these are components of that model I showed you, and all these are things that we try and measure when we try and quantify traffic safety culture in a community. And I'll give you an example of some work we're doing with the commission here in Washington State. Um, this is a preliminary data set, but we're trying to understand traffic safety culture in Washington State around the choice to drive within two hours of smoking or consuming marijuana and drinking alcohol. So we're looking at traffic safety culture behind polydrug use. And the reason is, is that polydrug use, usually alcohol and, and cannabis, is sharply rising in Washington State. So we're trying to understand the role of culture in that rise, in that risky behavior, and then develop cultural-based strategies to try and reduce that behavior. So this is the Qualtrics panel, which just means it's a, a, a paid panel. Uh, Qualtrics is the company that you send them your survey, and, and their paid participants um, complete the survey for you. Uh, 180 people participated, all Washington State residents. Uh, they drive a vehicle at least monthly. They consume alcohol at least monthly, and they smoke marijuana at least monthly. Uh, they're aged 18 to 70 years, 66% of them are female, 39% said 
self-reported they were chronic users. 14% uh, self-reported they use marijuana just for medical purposes. 28% just for recreational purposes. And 58% for a combined purpose. And essentially what we are looking at, in the past 12 months, how often have you driven within two hours of consuming alcohol or marijuana? That's the ultimate behavior we're trying to change, the decision to drive after you've consumed both of those drugs. And there you see the reported frequencies. The punchline is 54% said they never have. People who drive regularly, use marijuana regularly, drink alcohol regularly, 54% said they never do. The problem is that means 46% said they have. 46% of this higher risk group engage at least once in this particular behavior. Some more often. You've got almost 6% of people are doing it daily, 7% doing it weekly. That's quite a few people out there if you generalize across the entire state. So it is an important topic to look at, um, and it's only a slight majority who are being safe. The question is why, and using our model, we can start to see why, what aspects of culture are pushing that decision to drive within two hours of uh, drinking alcohol and consuming marijuana. So we can look at the model as a framework to analyze the data. And we can break up the analysis into, into three components. The first part is looking at the core model. What are the direct predictors of willingness and intention to engage in that risky behavior? Once we know what the main predictors are, we can take a step backwards and see what beliefs are creating those predictors. And our goal is then to identify strategies that change beliefs. And the final step is to look at the values that those people have who engage in the behavior, because whatever you want to do with them, it can't contradict their value system. Because value systems are fairly stable and they're entrenched. They're hard to change values. You can leverage values, but you don't want to conflict with values because people will not listen to your message. Because it conflicts with what's core to who they are. So we'll start by looking at some data using this model for this particular sample. And don't panic, there's a little bit of statistics in here, but we'll be okay. So the first question is, is the decision to drive within two hours of using alcohol and cannabis, is that a deliberate, willful behavior? That's our presumption, because this whole cultural thing only really works with deliberate behaviors. So we did some regression to see how well willingness and intention predicted the behavior. So willingness we measured with questions like, how willing would you be to drive within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana if you still felt buzzed or high? And that red dot means that the more willing you were, the more likely you were to engage in the behavior, red being dangerous. Point two, is on a, a scale from zero to one. So closer are you to one, the stronger the relationship, the stronger the prediction. It was significant, but point two um, is not as large as it could be, which is 1.0. We also asked about intention. How likely is it you will drive within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana at least once in the next 12 months? That was much higher, 0.58. So it turns out that willingness predicts intention, but intention is the bigger driver of the behavior. This is a thing people plan to do. They think about doing it. They expect to do it in the future. The question is, why do they have that expectation? So we took a step back in the model to see what predicts willingness and intention. Attitudes, we asked things like, how do you feel about driving within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana? And we had a list of different attitudes, dangerous, safe, stupid, cool, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was at 0.25, significant, but not huge. Which is to say, if people had more favorable attitudes, they were more likely to do it. As we'll see in a minute, people who do it think they're safe. 
They have the attitude that combining the two drugs is safe. We also looked at questions around norms. How common do you think it is for people like yourself to drive within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana? 0.16. Still significant, a little less than attitudes. It does have a role. What people think is normal has a role in this case. The more they think it's common for people like them to do it, the more they do it. Then we have the other kind of norm about acceptability. How acceptable would most people important to you feel it is for you to drive within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana? That's the much bigger one, point four. People who think other people important to them approve are more likely to do it. And then lastly, perceived control. How easy would it be for you to refrain from driving within two hours of consuming alcohol and marijuana? Minus 0.19, it's green, because the more perceived control you have to refrain, the less you do it. So looking at this, we begin to see some possible strategies to change the behavior, or at least the willingness and intention to engage in the behavior. How can we reduce attitudes, reduce the perception that it's normal, reduce the perception it's approved, and increase people's sense of control to avoid the behavior? So we're trying to reduce attitudes, reduce perceived norms, and increase perceived control. How do we do that? We take a step back in the model again and see what are the beliefs underlying attitudes, the beliefs underlying norms, the beliefs underlying perceived control. And that's where you start to see beliefs you can try and target with strategies. So we'll just we'll give a few examples here. This is behavioral beliefs. Behavioral beliefs are beliefs about the consequences of the behavior. Behavioral beliefs are what inform your attitudes, whether it's positive or negative. If you think there are positive consequences, you'll have a positive attitude. If you think ne negative consequences, you'll have a negative attitude. And again, the, the height of the bar, the number, the closer to one, either positive or negative, the stronger the influence that belief has on attitudes. <clears throat> so we have several beliefs here in red. I will feel calmer. I will be more aware of the environment around me. I will be better able to respond to unexpected events. People who held those beliefs strongly intended to drive after combining those drugs in the future. So these are the beliefs that lead them to have a positive attitude about doing this behavior because they think they're going to be calmer, more aware, and able to respond better to unexpected events. Hence, they have a positive attitude. Hence, they're more willing and intentional in their behaviors, or in the behavior of doing this. <clears throat> this is an important result because these are all false beliefs. If there's anything the basic research shows about the effects of alcohol and cannabis separately, and undoubtedly alcohol and cannabis together, you may feel calmer, but you are not more aware, and you're least of all able to respond to unexpected events. So within this culture, they've acquired some false, erroneous beliefs. One of the possible strategies is to help dispel these false, erroneous beliefs. And we can talk about how we might do that later on. The other aspects, people who think they're more likely to be arrested, who believe their reaction times are slower, who think they're more likely to crash, those are protective. People who believe that are less likely to have a positive attitude and are less likely to engage the behavior. So another set of strategies are to impact those protective, by protective beliefs by increasing the perception they're likely to get arrested if they combine the drugs together, to give them some experience that reinforces that the reaction times are slower, and to reinforce a belief that they're likely to get into a crash. So you can start to see that we're able to develop rational strategies around the culture underlying this particular behavior to help shift that um, culture, in this case to shift that attitude toward the behavior itself. The next one I want to look at is injunctive beliefs, and this is about what people think is acceptable. And we ask them, how do these different groups of people think about the acceptability of you engaging in this behavior. What they thought themselves, family, friends, employers, 
most people who drink alcohol, most people who use marijuana, most people in Washington State. And all of them had an influence on their perceived norms. They're all significant, but you can see the heights of the bars are slightly different. The influence of how acceptable people thought family, friends, and employers were about this behavior is higher than broader, more nebulous categories, most people who drink, most people who use marijuana, most people in Washington state. The higher bars, again, mean this had a stronger effect on future intention. So this graph tells us if we're going to develop some strategies to portray and promote beliefs that important people disapprove of the behavior, it should be with groups of people who are closer to the target group we're focusing on. So we could use messaging from families, messaging from friends, messaging from employers as a way of shifting the culture about perceived acceptability of this behavior. It would be less effective to talk about Washingtonians in general because this data shows us that people relate to what they think people think who are closer to them socially than distant from them socially. So again, here one way to uh, tackle this particular side of the equation is to look at how we can do strategies around communications and messages that come from family, friends, and employers because that has the strongest influence on the culture of this particular group. I'll skip that one. And then when we talk about, we know now what the beliefs are that have a role, we can start thinking about strategies that might impact those beliefs, but we need to think about the values that these groups have as well, because we don't want to bash heads with their value systems because they'll block us out and won't listen to us. So from some other work we've done, we uh, looked at the values that people have who never use marijuana, who have used marijuana in the past year but never drive after consuming it, and the dark black people who use marijuana and drive after using it within two hours. And this is a spider graph for a whole number of different values around the outside. And we can look at this spider graph and see what differentiates the high risk group from the low risk group the most. And there's two areas where this happens. Uh, first, enjoyment of life. People who use marijuana, whether or not they drive after using it, value enjoying life more than people who don't. So that suggests one way of potentially effectively impacting and messaging this group is to give messages that reinforce enjoyment of life. If you want to enjoy life, don't do this, you'll have a crash. If you smoke and, and drink alcohol, you could injure someone, that would have, through guilt, that would affect your enjoyment of life going forward. So trying to connect your messaging to the values that are important to this particular group. On the flip side, people who smoke or uh, use marijuana are far less conformatory than those who don't. So messaging all about complying with, conforming to, probably wouldn't sit very well. So the, the purpose of looking at uh, values in this way is to help direct your messages in a direction that resonates with your audience and doesn't clash with the value system of your audience. And you might end up with something like this. This is a New, uh, New Zealand commercial intended for um, young tribal members uh, in their community to intervene when they sense someone's too drunk to drive. No one's done any yet for too stoned to drive or combined drugs yet, but you get an idea of how this might play out. And this, again, was designed to fit into the culture of this particular group of young males. Go ahead. Oh, no. George is driving. He's too wasted. I should say something, but I could look dumb in front of Monique. Bro, Monique says you're dumb, but if he crashes, I'll have to live with his family. Puzzle time. And if he dies, Bruce George will haunt me forever. Grab a chip. 
Want a chip? You know I can't grab your goose chips. Go away. Spoon. Spacehead. Boo. Willie, what are you doing, bro? Oh, I've been internalizing a really complicated situation in my head. What are you on about? I don't think you should drive. No. Nah. No, nah, you're too drunk, bro. You just crash here. Yeah, it's crash here. Okay. <laughs> Stop a mate from driving drunk. Legend. So that commercial was based on understanding the culture, not just behind driving drunk, but the culture behind when do you intervene to stop someone from driving drunk. And part of the project that we're doing with Washington Traffic Safety Commission is to not look just at how traffic safety culture affects the decision to drive after using alcohol and marijuana. We're also looking at interventions behavior, because most people don't do it. So how do we understand the culture that drives people's decision to intervene when they see someone about to drive? after consuming alcohol and marijuana. How can we increase that behavior, intervention behavior, at the same time we're trying to reduce the risky behavior itself? It's that two-pronged attack. But I want to leave you with a, a few more ideas. Um, and one of the points is, I've showed a lot of videos here because they just make for, hopefully, good watching. But social media is not the only way to change culture. It's a very effective way to change culture because you get um, large exposure to people fairly uh, quickly and efficiently. But I think to move forward with transforming our culture, we need to think about additional strategies to use in addition to social media. Um, and here's some half-picked ideas of how to do that. <clears throat> so one of the key things uh, in changing beliefs, which you saw is key to this whole idea, um, is to evoke constructive dialogue to create experiences that force people into a conversation, that force people into questioning their beliefs. And there's a book out called Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott and talks about what we actually call in constructive dialogue, two-way conversations, groups of people who share a culture talking together. It's a multi-direction dialogue. Um, and engaging really significantly deep conversation that ultimately constructs a new culture for that group. And to do that, you need to talk about critical issues, like the safety of your children when they're driving. You need to integrate reality. What is the effect of a seatbelt? Are my beliefs about what a seatbelt does wrong in terms of protecting you? Provoke learning. I don't know enough about this. I need to learn something new. And in having these dialogues, the goal is that the dialogue becomes the relationship. You actually strengthen your culture and the relationship amongst the people in your family or in your friend group or at your workplace by having these conversations. It connects you closer together. And here's some examples. So one kind of experience, this is actually a real thing, uh, I saw at a uh, French car show in Paris. Um, families come up, get inside this Renault Clio. It's like on a pig spit. It's got cameras everywhere. You click in your seat belts, and this happens. The family gets out. You're handed a DVD with a picture of your family spinning in it. That provokes a conversation. Timmy, this is why we wear a seatbelt. Dad, that's why we want you to wear a seatbelt. It challenges people's assumptions and beliefs about what a seatbelt does, because you're experiencing a rollover crash. That leads to a change in beliefs if the conversation is engaged deep enough to challenge your beliefs, question reality, learn more, and connect to each other to reinforce your culture. The best way of doing that is to do that without seatbelts on, but that's not something even the French would do. This is another example. This is a group experience, again. And you can imagine families, groups of friends in here. And this happens. Oh, shit. Oh.
So that's an example of a social experiment, people unsuspecting in a, in a group situation, and they hijacked their phones and created that experience. Now undoubtedly, that's gonna lead to conversation amongst the groups of friends when at the bar later, or the families that went there, and if done correctly and deeply and sincerely, authentically, those conversations can lead to a shift in the beliefs and the actions of that family. The families, for example, might have a no cell phone rule now because of that event that they, that they self-regulate amongst the family within their culture not to have the cell phone out or even on while they're driving. So aside from social media, thinking about experiences you can expose groups of people to which would create these constructive dialogues that challenge beliefs and assumptions and in the end foster a closer relationship, a, a closer bond amongst the group members involved. The other idea um, is to engage the social environment that already exists around us. And the notion is, is that there are positive social factors in our social environment everywhere. It just happens driving takes us away from those. When's the last time you had a collision in a grocery store? Right? If you think about it, we're, we're, who had a collision walking into this room today? Anybody flip somebody off today because they didn't like how they, what they're eating for breakfast or anything? No. We're social beings. We've evolved as social beings. We've, we've evolved around social etiquette, uh, social behavior, social interaction, social factors modify our behavior. That's how we function every day successfully. You stick someone in a car where they feel anonymous in a closed can with other closed cans around them, all the social factors that normally guide our civil behavior are out the window. So how do we bring back in those naturally existing, normally functional social factors into driving so we behave civilized and courteous to each other? So we've been speaking a lot about autonomous vehicles and intelligent vehicles um, and what they can do. And one suggestion coming out of Australia is that you actually use these vehicles to reduce anonymity and to use vehicles to show relevant social connections between me as a driver and the other road users around me. And the idea is the connected vehicle concept where cars talk to each other and pass information back and forth. They ask, actually pass information about the occupants back and forth not your social security number, or anything like that. What's your favorite football team? What's your favorite band? Where do you live? Not your house number, your city. Um, and through a head-up display, or some other kind of display, the system would pop up icons representing this more personable information above all the other vehicles. So that person is no longer an idiot in a Camry, for example. Um, it's a fellow Husky fan. Or um, that person over the truck is actually a friend of my sister. Because we know we interact socially, we do pay attention to how similar people are to us. It's a basic psychological principle. People who are similar to us, that we're familiar with, we automatically like more because of the similarity and familiarity. And we treat them differently, we treat them better. That can happen in a closed tin when it's another closed tin. But if that thing is no longer a closed tin, it's now another supporter of the same sporting team you do, you start to trigger these natural social factors. Ooh, that person's like me. I automatically like them more. I'll be more attentive and more courteous to them when they try and move over into the lane. Just an idea. This one is gonna freak out the traffic engineers. Take a deep breath. This is how the traditional way we design roadway systems. We engineer out every bit of uncertainty. You're in your car, so you're already sort of locked off and autonomous in your tin, tin can. You stay in your lane, you look at that light. If that light's red, you stop. If it's green, you go. There's a turning arrow, you follow the turning arrow. You basically obey the physical environment designed around you. Pedestrians, we separate you by guardrails, we put you in ramps underneath, we separate the hazard. 
How is there any form of social interaction in that environment? You're just complying with blinking lights and arrow turns and staying in your lane and what your car is telling you. There's no normal social interaction that we use every day to survive as a social species. So there's a concept called open spaces, which is being um, used more and more in Europe, particularly places like uh, the Netherlands, where they do the exact opposite. They put back every piece of uncertainty possible, and it looks like this, brace yourself. And what happens in that situation is, there's uncertainty, like there is in many aspects of our world. And the only way to successfully navigate that situation is to interact to look at each other, to make a questioning gesture, to invite the person ahead. It forces people out of their tin box to interact normally, socially, constructively, cordially, in order to mutually get through this scenario. And that's what it actually looked like. The one on the left was the original intersection in Dresden, Netherlands, and the one on the right is what it looked like afterwards. They had more throughput after than before, with no serious collisions. Speeds went down. There was more courteous behavior, because you had to. You're no longer anonymous. You're no longer just following what the road says. You have to interact with other road users, negotiate how to get through. So you have to slow down, pay attention, and interact socially to negotiate through. As a side note, you can perhaps see the um, fountain in the middle. That was kind of cool. The height of the fountain depended on how much traffic was blocked up to the uh, roundabout. So as you're approaching the roundabout, if you see a very high fountain, you know there's traffic ahead, and you can slow down and prepare. But the point here is, is that the traditional way of designing our, our roadway system takes away to me the normal process of interacting courteously and, and, and socially appropriately. You just follow the rules. And the idea is that you go back to creating situations where people have to socially interact, where they have to be courteous to mutually solve the problem of getting to the intersection together. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the other aspect of traffic safety culture is that we're not just focusing on the individuals who engage in the risky behavior. We're also focusing on the people who don't and use them as allies um, to help the, the risky people be safer. And we're also looking at how all the different social groups that impact a traffic safety issue, what their cultures are like, how those could be changed, and what actions they could take to point in the same direction toward the same goal, in this case, target zero. So what are things that families and friends can do? What are things that uh, workplaces and schools to do? What things that your different communities can do, different agencies can do? What can everybody do to target toward getting to zero um, altogether? And it's only by having all those different layers of the social ecology shift their culture in the same direction that we'll be able to get to zero, as nicely demonstrated by this last video.
And with that, I'll leave you with a shameless plug that we're having a symposium in Bozeman in June, and it talks about our, our approach toward traffic safety culture. Uh, you can find that described on our link right there, and we'd love to see you in uh, sunny Bozeman. Thank you for your morning time with me.